Deepak Ganesan is uh, an associate professor there in the Department of Computer Science. And he received his PhD from UCLA in 2004. Um, and for those of you with an IIT background, he's from IIT Cross. Um, he has many numerous awards. I won't be able to list them all, but he has an NSF Career Award, the IBM Faculty Award, and a, U a UMass Teaching Award. Um, and he's also received many best paper awards, most recently the ACM SIGCHI uh, Award this year, 2013, for the best paper in CHI, and also um, honorable mention for best paper at UBICOMP, I think uh, Andrew was there for that. Um, well known in the sensing system, sort of mobile computing communities, and so uh, we're really excited to have him here today. Thank you, Dave. Pleasure to be here. I know a lot of people here, and it's a great place. And uh, you know, it's it's particularly uh, nice to be talking about this this topic, which is on, on behavioral sensing, because a lot of the landmark work um, on mobile health has come out of here. And I know there's a lot of ongoing projects, so I'm glad to be talking about this topic here. So, um, you know, the good news obviously is that it, to some extent is that uh, I don't have to s sell the problem to you. Right? You probably already have seen a lot of the work in this area, so I don't have to uh, convince you that this is an important problem to work on. But the bar is high that I have to convince you that there's interesting work to be done and that we've done, and so I hope to do that. All right, this is uh, joint work with a lot of different people. Um, as we say, the students get to do the work and I get to take the credit, so students, students and other collaborators have done a lot of work on this. All right, so. Um, you know, the excitement surrounding mobile sensing is really driven by the smartphone and, and the various accessories, the health accessories that you see growing um, in the commercial domain. Everything from, you can see, chest bands, wristbands that measure uh, activity. And we always think of the, the vision of the day where, well, today it may be burdensome to wear all of these devices, but one day, hopefully, they will all be integrated in and you won't even notice that they're there. And um, you know, a lot of these devices will be continuously sensing your, you know, various aspects of you as an individual, right? And um, why does all of this matter? And I took this quote. Uh, this quote is often used um, at NIH, and um, you know, and, and and the and this was by Christopher Paul Weil, who is a biostatistician, and he says, uh, the point is that you have to measure what's called the exposome, right? Which is a play on the word genome. Right, um, there's been a ton of work on understanding genomic markers, um, but what's really lacking is our ability to get the environmental markers, right? And the environmental markers is a sum total of some, you know, all the, the, the environmental influences in your health throughout your, uh, your life, essentially, all right? Now, what do I mean by the exposome? And this is an example of what, what, um, what would be an exposome for a particular kind of uh, health condition, and uh, you know, a smoking relapse or, or uh, drug addiction. And I'll talk about drug addiction a little bit more as I, uh, as I go through my talk. And by the way, feel free to interrupt, feel free to ask questions. That obviously makes my, my job more enjoyable as well. So feel free to stop me anytime. Um, so imagine a, imagine a time when you know, you, everybody, uh, let's say an individual is wearing a variety of different sensors. Either it's integrated within their clothing. Let's not think about how exactly they're wearing it. Uh, it could be uh, the smartphone, obviously, and, and patterns from the smartphone, but it could be a variety of other sensors um, that you're collecting raw data from. And from the raw data, you're inferring, um, I think, three classes. You're making three classes of intermediate inferences from that data. One class is the patient's physiology that's intrinsic to them. So that could be the respiration rate, that could be things like the heart rate, the heart rate waveforms. Um, um, the other is the actions that the patient makes in their environment. That could be whether they're sedentary or not, whether they're moving their hand to the mouth, uh, which might indicate that they're smoking or eating. Um, that could be conversation patterns. And the third is the patient's environment, which is the cues that you see, the environmental cues that, uh, that actually influence people to do something different. And, and really, most of our work is focused on being able to obtain these kinds of inferences through, from a variety of these sensor sources. 
And, and the hope is as you, as you get all of this data and you can uh, look at all of this data in conjunction, you're going to be able to get to a point where you get to these relapse markers or um, you know, whether it's of drug addiction or smoking. That's, I think, the grand, if you look at the grand objective of what one would like to do, it's to come up with this kind of a picture, but for an individual, for specific individuals, and be able to find a marker that's ahead of time and in a timely manner so that somebody can, um, that, that the appropriate caregivers can intervene. We're far from this point, so I just wanted to make that clear. We're far from this point, but this is, I think, the grand objective when you look at uh, behavioral health sensing as a whole. So um, there are grand challenges. I mean, that's the objective. There are grand challenges. And, and our uh, work in particular, I think, hits on two big uh, challenges in this space. One is, uh, again, uh, a quote from Christopher Paul Wilde, which says, there's a desperate me need to develop methods there are precise markers of the health condition, right? I mean, genomic markers are very, very precise. And can we get behavioral markers that are precise? It's a very hard problem. And one that I don't, for both of the problems here, I'm not claiming to solve them entirely. I'm just saying this, these are the grand challenges that we will have to solve over the next decade. The second is more on the systems and sensor side. And the second is that we need sensors that can precisely uh, get at these markers of behavior. Sometimes we might have sensors that give you a lot of uncertainty about the particular marker, right? But we need sensors that are more precise, more directed at that, the behavioral marker that we need. And of course, power looms as being, uh, power as in energy and power looms as being the big challenge in getting people to actually use these sensors. It's one thing to say that, well, I have this great chest band, it's gonna measure something for you, but another thing to actually go about and encourage people or convince people that they need to wear it 24-7. Uh, right? that's, that's a very hard problem. And on the system side, uh, power and the need to measure things accurately are really the big um, challenges that we need to address. So in, in my talk, the way I'm going to go about it is I'm going to take a base case scenario for both of these and then, um, and then build out from there and talk about some of these uh, the big challenges and some of our uh, ongoing work to address some of the, the deeper, harder problems um, in each of these domains. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, the data side, which is on behavioral um, sensor data processing. And I'm going to talk about the base case, which is uh, detecting drug usage, um, so cocaine usage. And this is a project that we have um, with uh, Yale University, Yale Psychiatry, and, and uh, funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. All right, so the, the question, uh, the broad question that we are targeting is, um, you know, you saw that exposome picture for, uh, for drug addiction. And the first step of that is can we detect a particular behavior in uh, the wild, right? We have to detect something before we can go off and say what actually causes it or what are the antecedents of that behavior, what are the predictors of that behavior. First, we have to detect it. In this case, the, the detection question is uh, the presence of drugs, okay? So um, specifically, we were looking at cocaine addicts and we were saying, well, can we detect cocaine use? Um, and um, using different sensors, but primarily uh, focusing on heart, heart rate. So the, uh, the study was done, um, this was, the first part of it is the inpatient part, where actually people were brought into a uh, lab setting. They were, they were brought into a lab setting, all right? And they, um, they had a dry out period of a few days where they did not use cocaine. And then they were given, um, different dosages, right? So they were, they were given eight milligrams of cocaine uh, for a short 20 minute period. They were given 16 and they were given 32 milligrams. And then after that, um, with gaps in between, and then after that they had a self-administration period where they could go off and click on their own and then actually get cocaine in their bloodstream. Um, so uh, the, the, you know, the dots on the top there represent, the, dot, the red dot and the blue dot represents the actual times when they clicked and the infusion times. In this particular case, every single time that they clicked, they got an infusion. Typically, there's a rate control that ensures that they don't actually overdose uh, and so on. So, there, and, and our goal was to say, well, can we actually detect that they had uh, cocaine in their bloodstream? And could, can we detect, can we even separate between perhaps these eight milligrams and 32 milligrams of cocaine, different dosages of cocaine? Um, now, why do we think it should work? Because uh, cocaine is known to have some effect in the heart. All right, so there's, uh, there's been lots of studies which have, um, you know, which have sketched out what effect cocaine has on 
the heart and the heart rate and, and various aspects of the heart, particularly the, the actual um, the morphological features in the heart are going to change depending on cocaine use. All right. So we had some hope going in that we were actually going to do relatively well in terms of detecting or, or that the ECG is the right modality, the sensor modality to detect uh, drug use. And so you can see here, um, you can see here that the changes. So this is, what I'm showing is a, kind of an idealized, if you will, waveform for different uh, sort of different segments. So baseline is the light blue curve here. Eight milligrams is, uh, you know, you get a little bit lower and you can see that the, this waveform is shifting out. And also there's some changes in this peak and this waveform is shifting out as well. 16 milligram, it shifts out a little bit further, 32 milligram further out. So this is, um, this is just showing that the morphological characteristics do change, um, right? And so what we're trying to do is pick out this morphological change um, by extracting appropriate features and so on and so on, right? That's, we want to detect the cocaine by sort of reversing this process from going from the actual waveform to detecting you know, how, you know, the presence of cocaine and, and the dosage. And um, it turns out that there's been a lot of work on, uh, on looking at, um, at the heart waveform and seeing whether, uh, uh, you know, looking at the effect of uh, cocaine on specific morphological features of the heart. But it also turns out that none of it is very uh, conclusive, right? There's a, in fact, we looked at literature and there were some uh, ambiguities and differences between what different people said. So probably because some populations reacted differently from others, some were more habituated, some were less habituated and so on. But it also means that machine learning techniques that looks at sort of the population as a whole as well as the individual should be able to do some of this automatically for us. So we looked at two things. One is, can we extract all of these features and actually, uh, is there a benefit to looking at these features in conjunction? And the second is perhaps more interesting, which is to say, let's say we knew nothing about what the heart waveform looks like. Can we do a, have a totally data-driven way of detecting cocaine uh, by not giving prior knowledge, not uh, assuming no knowledge? And so we extracted all of these different types of features from the waveform. So you know, there's the R peak. There are all these peaks. If you look at the, the ECG waveform, there's different peaks, P, Q, R, S, and T. And so uh, we extracted all of these peaks. And I'll talk a little bit more about the difficulty here in a second. But we extracted all of these peaks. We got different features, which was the time duration between the peaks, the height of the peaks, and so on. And uh, we also uh, did a what W here is waveform features, which means we didn't extract any peaks at all. We just gave the data set, standardized data set directly to the classifier and said, you figure it out, okay? And so we looked at these two different ways of um, classifying cocaine use versus not. And we looked, uh, and we, you know, we used a standard, fairly uh, well-known logistic regression classifier, which is just a linear um, discrimination boundary. So a linear classifier here. And these are the results. I don't want to talk about it too much, except to say that the individual features, which are on the right here, don't do as well. So by the way, in each bar is basically, uh, you know, the light blue is baseline versus eight, baseline versus 16. The darker ones are baseline versus everything else, right? So the individual features don't do so well, right? But as you get towards the waveform, which is just giving the data to the classifier, that does really well to get about 90, 95%, more than 90% uh, in, in many of these cases. And uh, using all the morphological features, which is extracting these P, Q, R, S, T, and so on, that does well as well, that does well too. And in fact, using them in conjunction, in some cases, does better. So the, the takeaway message here is that in lab settings, the classification does pretty well, okay? Um, and there's some, there's the respiration, the, the heart rate here does well as well, but it's confounded by activity and so on. So I should mention here that even though I'm not showing, we do have data that looks at this uh, cocaine versus activity, cocaine versus other kinds of drugs, at least at one other drug which is supposed to behave methylphenidate, and the classification accuracy seems to hold in these cases as well. All right, so um, that's an example. Now, as I said, um, I, you know, this is our the base case, and so far I've largely used um, sort of standard machine learning methods and 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 looked at the problem. So what I'm going to transition to is addressing a few hard problems that actually emerge in this space. And, and, um, and these are problems that I can't, we can't claim to have completely solved, but these are things that are incredibly important as we transition from looking at data in lab settings to
to actually going out and then um, you know, looking at data as uh, things evolve in the natural environment. One is noise. Right? This is a, you know, even with these chest bands, even with these kinds of, da the, the kind of devices that, um, uh, you know, per particularly with a chest band. So ECG, the ECG devices that we are um, um, using are chest bands as opposed to the clinical ICU grade 12 lead ECG, right? So it moves around, right? The person is going to the restroom, the ECG changes, the person shifts around, the ECG changes. We also had the person wear these ECG chest bands within the unit as opposed to only during the cocaine session, and there's a lot of variability. And this is, this looms as perhaps you know, the lab to feel generalizability of uh, our methods looms as perhaps one of the hardest problems that we will have to tackle in, in many of these kinds of um, inferences. So uh, in this particular case, in our ECG case, you see a lot of baseline drift. Although it's relatively clean signals, you see sensor dropouts because the sensor just, for whatever reason, it's shifted a little bit, there's limited contact, the sensor drops out, there's noise in the ECG patterns, Essentially, your, your signal is never going to look precisely like what you might expect from an ICU quality sensor. All right? And so the question is, how do you deal with it? And this requires um, two fairly sophisticated methods. So one of the techniques that we've been using here is uh, what's called sparse coding. And, and the idea here is that the idea here is that if you take any of these noisy waveforms, right? Um, it is, you know, and, and if you take an idealized smooth version of the waveform, right, it's going to look like one of these peaks here. So what we do is you take a lot of raw data, unsupervised data, just take a lot of raw ECG data and extract canonical peaks from that data, right? So this process of extracting this canonical, what's called basis elements is done completely automatically, all right? And the idea here is, you know, you extract some potential peak and you extract waveforms that kind of look and capture those peaks. And you can see here, these capture many different characteristics of a potential peak in an ECG, okay? So you extract these basis elements, and then when you get new data, then you can express any new data as a combination of this basis element. And so what we are essentially doing here, the process we are doing here is we are removing noise by using this basis elements to more compactly represent the noisy data that you're getting, okay? So you can think about it as another way of removing noise from data, except it's, it's a sort of a way of, um, you know, looking for things that you might want to see in an ECG waveform, and then saying, well, I have this noisy stuff here. What, which of these elements, which combination of elements corresponds to that? Now, why do I do that? Because once you extract this, once I know that it, this particular peak here is, 0.8 times this basis element here, then it is much easier for me to classify this peak or this element than it is to classify the raw data. Okay, so that's the process here. And the learning process um, is, is essentially a way of saying, well, I want to minimize the, the, the error between a reconstructed peak as well from the original one. So some weighted combination of these elements should be roughly equal to each of these peaks here, and that's the, the mechanism here. So this, this is a kind of a powerful approach to, to take noisy data, and then um, you have some predefined dictionary of elements, right, and say this noisy data that I'm getting is approximately equal to this combination of this dictionary. And once I know that, that this dictionary uh, is, is a representation, I can then go off and say, well, how does this dictionary elements correspond to um, um, you know, the, the thing being classified. Let me get. No. You don't have to label the dictionary. So the dictionary is obtained completely unsupervised. So we take every peak. So you have, you run a peak detector, which could get all kinds of peaks. It could be garbage peaks, it could be good peaks. But more, you know, it'll, it'll gonna get a lot of peaks from the data. And then on all of those peaks, you learn the basis by saying what weighted combination of all of these plus some error term uh, minimizes uh, or reconstructs these peaks um, accu as accurately as possible. Right now we are doing it on an individual basis, but remember this can be done without labeling, so it doesn't really matter. Um, yes, it is in this case. I just realized that as I was looking at it. <laughs> 
Uh, actually, well, um, let me think about this for a second. So, uh, all right, fair enough. I'll take that. <laughs> in this case, 50. Uh, we choose 50, but I think there is a problem. I, th I think there is a question here in terms of, you know, is there an optimal set of dictionary elements and so on. We haven't gotten to that. We just chose 50 arbitrarily. Um, and, and I should say for, for very fairly noisy data, we're, we get about 94% of the peaks correctly labeled using dictionary elements. And actually, we also use the sequence information. So a P, PQRST follows a sequence, P, then a Q, then a R, then S, then a T, and so on and so forth. You use all of that, you can get peak labeling done very well. And, and part of uh, what we want to do here is have um, waveforms, you know, if you think about an ICU quality sensor, right, incredibly expensive devices, but ICU quality monitors actually give you these peaks automatically. They have ways of extracting that when it's very nice data. What we want to do is to do some of that stuff through just data collected in the wild with all the noise and with all the variability. And that's, I think, in some ways we are trying to mirror you know, what, what, what would the ICU quality device give you, and can we get that in the wild, right? But it's, it's harder because it's a much noisier signal. Any other questions? Okay, so this is one example of how, uh, you know, we're going about dealing with, uh, with noise. So here's another problem. Um, and another interesting problem is that as you go towards real world conditions where there's a lot of noise, you have to deal with, this pro with fusing information. Right, uh, that you're, you're going to get more robust signatures if you can take a lot of sensors and you can fuse the information. Right? And so behavioral fusion is, is a fantastic idea, particularly because, well, more sensors should mean more uh, ability to reason about things in general, not just get more robust inferences, but also maybe ask uh, causation types of questions or correlational questions and so on. So it's an interesting idea in general, although I must, you know, the problem here being we're, you know, getting data sets and the ability to collect these kinds of data sets is the problem. So I don't, you know, we didn't actually, we don't yet have um, data sets that do this, although in the outpatient part of the cocaine um, study, what we're actually putting on people is a, a phone, a variety of monitors, we're monitoring location, a galvanic skin response, ECG, respiration, just about the kitchen sink, and seeing if we can get to this point of being able to monitor a lot of different aspects of individual behavior. But this is one of the, I think, this is one of the big interesting challenges as we move forward with a lot of streams of data. But we have been able to look at this problem in the context of the phone. And we've asked the question of, well, with a phone, you can measure activity, right? There's an accelerometer, you can, and gyroscope, magnetometer, you can measure activity patterns to some degree of accuracy. You can monitor location, uh, clearly. You can monitor social interactions, and so, uh, you know, I, I know that others have done um, a lot of work with, uh, with a microphone. In this case, we just looked at Bluetooth, right? Just the fact that you know, there's another Bluetooth device that's beaconing nearby gives you some information about the device that's nearby, Not, and that device is associated with a person. So if you take all of this and if you run a variety of inference algorithms on that, and then you look at how these inference algorithms relate to each other, these contextual inferences sort of correlate with each other both at any time point, because at any time point, my location might be dependent on uh, my activity pattern. You're mostly sedentary at work, right? So just by knowing you're sedentary, you might be able to figure out that you're at work. Just by knowing that you're at work, you might be able to figure out that you're largely going to be sedentary, right? And just by knowing your social interactions, you can figure out where you are, right? So there are interesting correlations among these that may not be obvious that you can get by just looking at the relationship between these not just at any particular time, but also the evolution of that over time. Right? So you can use these structures called dynamic Bayesian networks to look at the evolution of these relationships across a variety of different uh, inferences that you might make and how it evolves. And so what we designed was a engine that, uh, you know, this, this was running on the phone, and applications could then ask for um, different things. So you, you, there are different ways of using this information. So uh, one could say, well, I want the energy budget to be, say, 20%. So you don't, you can sense all of this, but I don't want to use more than some percentage of the phone's battery doing that. And what that would mean is that it leverages these correlations, but shuts off, say, the GPS or something else, but still gives you a location because you know that social interactions and activity relate in a particular way to the location. Right? 
Or you could say, well, I have, you know, I have certain things that are private to me, like I don't want people to know I'm at home, but you're leaking that information by revealing something else because the Bluetooth information might reveal that you're at home, right? So how, so you can sort of holistically look at the privacy exposure um, across all of these different variables. Or an application might say, you know, I'm willing to tolerate some uncertainty. How about that? You know, just go ahead and give me that, give me this information, but with some uncertainty. So there are different ways of using it, but it gets to this question of how do I leverage different things in conjunction. All right. So um, again, that 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 hits at some some of the aspects of um, sort of how we are dealing with data. All right. So for the second part, um, I'm going to talk about our work on the other side, which is on the sensor systems and um, on the, um, the power, if you will, side of um, these kinds of embedded sensing devices. And uh, again, I'm going to ta talk, uh, start with a base example of a particular device we've designed and, 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 um, and then talk about some of the challenges in that and how those kinds of challenges sort of are broader and, and, and lead to what I would, one would consider the grand problems, um, grand challenge problems over the next several years. So we designed um, a, uh, this one, this is a, what we call a computational eyeglass. You probably can't see it, but this eyeglass here has a, um, a camera that's looking at the eye, all right? A camera that's looking at the output. Uh, so you'll have to ignore these, uh, these, uh, these wires. It's just that we haven't had time to actually lay it out properly. But um, there's a camera looking at the eye. There's a camera looking at the outside world. There's head movement sensors, there's audio sensors. So head movement sensors tell you where you're looking, right? orientation of your head. The audio sensors, um, these microphones can potentially sort of be used for figuring out if you are talking to me who you are, speaker ID, or where you are, beam forming type thing. All right. Now, and the reason we got into this was, you know, remember one of the things I said was early on was, you know, the, behavior, the contextual information is, is interesting, right? What are people looking at? Where, you know, where, what, what, where is the cognitive attention of an individual going, right? Am I paying attention to something or not, right? And um, are there smokers nearby? Am I looking at a smoking advertisement? There are all kinds of interesting things in the environment, uh, which from a behavioral perspective, if you knew that, that an individual's cognitive attention was going there, could be very valuable. Now, of course, more broadly, there's the Google Glass, um, sort of way of looking at the world, which is advertisements, if you will. And so you could look at it that way, although I'm not going to talk about that. But again, just to just for those of you who might be wondering what the difference is, the Google Glass is essentially a um, front-facing camera that's for HD sort of video capture, right? It essentially you say, well, I don't want to pick up my phone and take pictures. You know, I just want to tap on my, uh, on my eyeglass, and then it records our, our video or, and displays email, which for the life of me, I wouldn't want that on my eyeglass, but maybe some of you like it, I don't know. But anyway, so this is, this is continuous gaze sensing and attention sensing and cognitive attention sensing. It's a very, it's a fascinating topic which, uh, you know, the Nobel laureate, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who did a lot of the work with decision making, uh, you know, a lot of his research on decision making and how people misinterpret the Bayes rule and so on was done using eye trackers. And, you know, I've been fascinated by that topic of, well, can we get these gaze trackers to work in real time on people so what we want to do from here, we want to do eye tracking, continuous eye tracking. So I figure out people's you know, pupil dilation, which you know, there's a the saying that the pupil is a window to the soul. In that even though other sensors may not detect things, the pupil dilation tells you a lot about pe people and their attention and, and uh, you know, where they're actually focusing. Um, and their gaze uh, patterns. You can also get sort of uh, driving drowsiness detection and so on. So that's why we designed this prototype, and it's about a 40 milliwatts, which is pretty pretty darn good. I mean, you know, uh, continuously operating both cameras, you know, that's about a factor of five or more, I think, uh, maybe maybe seven or eight less than a Google Glass. All right, so that's the computational eyeglass. But there are several challenges here that I think I want to I want to touch a little bit on. One is, what can such a platform sense in real time? All right. And this gets it, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. We can always store the data and ship it off, but what can you do in real time? Right. And this hits at one of the problems which I'm interested in, which is you know, just the ability to do things at low power as close to the sensor device as possible. And the other question, perhaps a much longer, um, perhaps more far-reaching, farther into the future question is, can I operate, you know, my, my device today operated 
operates at about 40 milliwatts. Can I get it to operate at four, 40 microwatts or 4 microwatts? What will it take to get to the point where these kinds of devices are no longer, you know, have a battery pack on them? And in our case, we have a battery pack that needs to be connected here. No longer have batteries, just wear them, we forget about them and move on. All right. So let's talk about the first one. And so you can see the video there from, from, the, from the gaze tracking. So this, the video there shows the eye and uh, gaze, move, gaze uh, as the X coordinate uh, you know, on that, um, the right side there. It keeps running in a loop, so you might get dizzy walk, you know, watching it for a while, but you know, you'll have to ignore it for a while you know, after you see it once. But the, the point is that we are able to do gaze tracking at about 30 frames per second on a microcontroller that has about 30 kilo, kilobytes of memory. All right. Now, these are not, oh, it stopped, great. So uh, these, are not, um, these are not very high-end cameras. All right. um, these are very simple cameras. But we are able to do all that gaze tracking at 30 frames per second. And the main idea there is that people, so what we uh, leverage is a neural network-based algorithm. So the idea here is that your eye, right, there's a lot of correlation in the pixels that you capture above your eye. And so if you can exploit that correlation, you don't need that many pixels in order to actually figure out where you're looking. That's the idea. That, you know, this imager has about, about 10,000 or 20,000 pixels there. But we need only about a few hundred pixels in order to figure out where your eye is looking. So we train a, a neural network to determine which pixels might you have to sample to get the most information about your eye. And then you, you just, Plug it in. You just put it into the microcontroller, right, and let it go. And that's it's essentially all we do, right? We learn the pattern, we bake it into the microcontroller, and that, in fact, even 30 frames per second, I think we can probably reach about 100. So, so, but that's the algorithm. Good question. So, in this particular case, uh, the training is you look at a monitor. And you have dots on the monitor. The dot is going around, and you look at the dot, and then we use that to train. Um, we want to get to the point where we are even calibrating on the fly. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but I mean, you know, but the, our, in our particular strategy, you just look at. I mean, you're, uh, there are some constraints that we use in our, uh, so far, which is you have to know kind of you have to sit a certain distance away from the screen, and then you look at a dot, and the dot moves around, and then you get a gaze pattern because the dot is moving around, and then um, you go off and do this. Now, I should admit there are commercial gaze trackers which do something similar to this. Uh, those gaze trackers, you, you basically carry something the size of that, you know, something like a hard disk or, or a flash drive together with a giant battery. And it's a data collection device. It's not real time. So, um, but yes, calibration. I mean, there's tons of problems. There's mechanical issues. I mean, I don't want this thing looking at my eye. And so there's all kinds of challenges. Um, but I think it gets to the point where we can expect to do these in real time. And it's a question of, you know, once, once you know that you can do it, then it's a question of actually sort of filling the gap. And it's a large gap, but, you know, I think getting to the point where we can do it. So I, in general, I'm interested in this question of how do I take a specific uh, high-level problem, like gaze tracking is a high-level problem. There could be detection of an arrhythmia, which is already some devices do. There could be detection of cocaine use. How do I push it all the way to the sensor level, and how do I get power, low power operation through that? through pushing the classification goal, taking the classification goal and pushing it all the way to the center. Because that, by collapsing the layers, you can actually do a lot better. And that's the, I think that's what excites me about, uh, you know, about, about the, the cross layer way of looking at this thing. Yeah. Yes, that's what we do. Um, currently, the inward facing camera is continuously doing gaze. On the outward facing camera, we can, currently we can record everything, but ideally what we, do, what we want to do is, um, is fixation, look for fixation and then record a video or an image, look for sudden gaze changes, record something. So in other words, I think I, I, I view this as our ability to reconstruct what events are happening right, by, by looking in the eye and looking at how your eye is reacting to events and then capturing the outside world to see what events are actually occurring. So your post facto, looking at the brain and how it works as, uh, you know, how it's shifting its attention. As far as the eye is concerned, you don't know if your cognitive thought is going into something else. 
but at least for real world events, how your cognitive attention is being uh, shifted over time. We haven't gotten to pupil dilation, though I, I, I hope to do that as well. And you know, we might have to have a different sensor for getting precise pupil information, um, but but you know, I think that's the that's the next step. Okay. So the next big problem is sensing at milliwatts to uh, to microwatts, and this is something that we've been sort of beating our head against for, for a few years now. And um, you might wonder why on earth is microwatts such a great regime? Why, why do I care about microwatts? And the reason I care about microwatts is if you look at wearable devices today, right? if you look at wearable devices today, uh, you know, we always imagine this world where, oh, you know, at least, at least the, the movies will tell you this or, or, or the popular press might, that there are these micro harvesters and they generate uh, power and voila, you have your sensor that just works. That would be fantastic, right? And so the problem, however, is that if you take a typical device, a sensor device, it operates at many at milliwatts or tens of milliwatts. If you take a harvester and think about how much energy that can give you, it's three orders of magnitude at the very least. It's three orders of magnitude lower than what you can, uh, what what you need. So there's a big gap between the demand side and the supply side, all right? And this gap is, is probably the most fundamental issue in order to really get us. Now, of course, even for a battery-powered device, if you could operate at microwatts, you're gonna get a lot of lifetime from it. Like, you can, you can operate for a month at a time, several months if you want, right, on a tiny device. But, you know, energy harvesting is pushing that yet another level to saying, well, you don't even need batteries anymore. But that's the gap that we wanna bridge, right? Demand versus supply. And this is an issue that we've been looking at for a while. You know, anytime, anytime you ask, a, anytime you have a, um, a, a sort of a performance bottleneck, you look at the breakdown. And that's what, and you see where, where does the energy go? So let's look at a breakdown of where the power goes um, in different uh, sort of aspects of your system. So the top, so the x-axis here is power consumption log, logarithmic scale microwatts, okay? And the y-axis is just three blocks. So sensing, computation, communication. You shouldn't look at them in conjunction. You should just look at them separately. So sensing, or the camera that I'm using here consumes roughly a milliwatt. Okay, that's uh, 1,000 microwatts, right? Um, the, an ECG, or ultra-low power ECG is about 30 microwatts. Not bad. Right? Pretty close to what you might get from a harvester. Uh, an accelerometer today is of the order of a microwatt, and in fact, there are if you, you know, people will tell you that, oh, we've gone sub microwatt to nanowatt. So accelerometers can go, go really, really low power. So the sensor side is coming along nicely, okay? Uh, computation side, if you take a microcontroller, right, even when it's active full bore, it's consuming less than half a milliwatt. In sleep mode, it's only consuming about 10 milli, mi, uh, microwatts or so. So it's in the ballpark of what energy you get, no problems. And in sleep mode, it's consuming way less, less than a microwatt, okay? So that's also not bad. Communication is trouble. Right? Take uh, 80 to 15.4, which is the Zigbee standard some of you might be aware of. That's way back, 60 milliwatts. Bluetooth low energy, depending on what rate you use, but certainly for the camera, it's, it's on the order of uh, milliwatts. Ultra wideband, people say that might be great. Milliwatts. So it's a huge issue in communication. So, so we said, well, what do we do about that? How do we fix communication and how do we fix the energy consumption of communication? So we've been using this technology called backscatter and it's the same technology that's used in RFIDs, except it's, for the longest time it's considered this niche technology that really doesn't, isn't useful for anything except RFIDs. And so RFIDs, you know, you might be aware of RFIDs or lots of these uh, commercial sort of things you buy these days, right? So this is a passive tag, things that are sticker, um, and uh, it just works by essentially reflecting a signal. So there's a reader, there's like a powered reader somewhere on the wall, somewhere on a doorway, and as you go past it, um, it gives the device power, and that device just reflects that, that signal back. Because it's reflecting, it doesn't need to generate any energy. That's a big difference. It's just reflecting a signal back, and uh, it's changing the signal in a way that makes the receiver get some data from the device. So, it's kind of modulating that signal and sending something back. Um, great, but you know, does it really work? So um, 
just to give you some numbers and, and give you sort of the picture of where we are. So if you take an active radio-based device, um, that you get about 60 milliwatts, that was the Zigbee radio, 120 kilobits per second, and 30 uh, feet, okay, you know, 10, 20 meters of, of range. Now, uh, there, were some, you know, there were some examples of uh, some prototypes of um, devices that researchers could use called the Intel WISP. Um, that's essentially a backscatter-based device that we could sort of play around with and write cool uh, stuff for. And just to give you an idea of what that got us to, so this, this device, which uses backscatter, still was about an order of magnitude uh, or more uh, lower power, right? but, but still well beyond the uh, 10 microwatts that I'm talking about. But it was terrible throughput, and it was terrible range. So just a toy okay, in many so and we've hammered away this problem of making, you know, how do we convert it from a toy to be something useful for several years now. And just to give you an idea of where we've reached, and this is really sort of the latest results. So we have reached the point where we are able to get the power consumption down to 15 microwatts. Okay, this is full tilt communication at 15 microwatts from a, and not through hardware breakthroughs, it turns out, through operating systems and systems uh, advances. So 15 microwatts. We are operating about 21 kilobits per second, not bad. And we can operate up to 20 feet at this point. So we are getting to a regime where, I mean, for the longest time, you know, I looked at this problem as it sounds interesting and I'd love to build uh, sort of, uh, you know, sensors that operate from this kind of passive power, but it's a toy and it's no point, there's no point doing it. I, I've reached the point where it's actually worthwhile to connect a sensor. In fact, we've run a camera with backscatter, with RF powered um, systems. So that's, I think, where we are. And, you know, and, you know, it'll take me a long time and probably an entire talk to tell you about how we got all of these optimizations in place, but I'll tell you one example. I'll give you one example of what's, uh, what's interesting. So here's an idea, and it's a simple idea, but, you know, then again, I think operating systems ideas, when they, when they actually work, are simple ideas. The idea is simple, that if you take um, an operating, if you take a device like this, and if you take all the code, all the network stack, everything that's running on it, and I just shatter it, I just fragment it to the smallest atomic pieces, so that no matter, even if I am, I'm getting so little power that I can run one instruction, that I can communicate one bit, the system still works. Right? The system, the whole, the system as a whole is able to operate even though I can drive down the amount of energy it needs to do take a small step forward to be the smallest possible. So think about it like you have a critical section or you have some atomic block in, in some piece of code in your software, that thing is big, right? A network stack needs to send a packet. A packet is too large. Um, you know, your OS might need to execute a, a, a piece of code that senses a value from the, uh, it takes a frame from a camera. That frame is too big. When power drives down, when you get, when you get to the point where you're, you have next to nothing, right, all of these will fail. So the idea is simple. We are taking the operating system, the entire operating system, and fragmenting it down to as small a piece that we can go to. And, that, and so let me give you an idea of the network stack. So the network stack works like this. We take a packet and we fragment it down so that you only need to send one bit at a time to a reader. You gather enough energy right, in your capacitors, in your buffer, transfer a bit, and then you go to sleep. And then remember, in deep sleep state, you're consuming very little power and you can actually recharge fairly easily, right? And then you transmit the next, next bit. And if your power, if you get more power, great, it, it sort of, it builds up and you, you can actually send an entire packet, but the whole point is we can scale down to the most extreme conditions. And just the ability to scale down gives us tremendous benefits. So this, um, this is sort of some of our results. We get, uh, we can operate, uh, you can see here that as you increase the uh, radio power, which is the transmitted power from a reader, most other schemes that have been proposed sort of taper out pretty quickly. You can get about five feet and that's it, you're dead. Right? You know, ours works pretty, you know, all the way out to about 20 feet. And in fact, interesting thing is, we work just as well as a battery powered device. Right, a harvesting based device that's working on micropower just works almost at the same range as a battery powered device as a result of being able to sort of tweak our operating system and then break it down in the manner that I mentioned. 
All right, so, um, and then throughput, of course, we reach about 20, um, uh, 20 kilobits per second here. So what we've been doing with that is going off and think, well, can we do that with tensor? So we actually got a camera to work, right, with backscatter. And the way we did that is by saying, well, I'm only going to trans, in fact, we broke down an entire pic, uh, image capture into the smallest units possible. Turns out the smallest units are setting a control pin, all right? Not even getting an entire pixel. It's setting a control pin for that pixel. Setting, uh, transitioning from the, uh, the digital, doing the ADC conversion, the analog to digital conversion, right? Setting a register. So if you can break everything down to tiny pieces, that means you can, you can scale down. And that's, I think, the, I mean, that's not to say that the information is going to be particularly great. If you, if you just sort of, if you can do one small thing at a time and it takes you five minutes to recover, then your image is going to be incredibly slow. And I should, full disclosure, I should say that that image was taken over a minute. It took a minute to get me all that pixels. But that is today, and that is with the prototype devices that we have. I think it is it's just the, the, the ability to do it is something that, that's an advance, um, at least given the current state, yeah. It's, it's all RAM retention. So this is deep sleep with RAM retention. So it's one of the interesting things is that deep sleep consumes next to nothing, Be, uh, even with RAM on. And that is the optimization. Many of these microcontrollers have gotten to the state where deep sleep is like 0.1 to even 0 0.01 microwatts. So far less than you, even the deepest, darkest conditions. I literally think uh, like down in that desk there, you have enough light on a small solar panel to keep you alive. So it, it, one of the optimizations that microcontrollers do is the ability to do deep sleep really, really well. And so that is one th that is, that's been great. That, that, is the, uh, that is an aspect to exploit. And in fact, um, there's been some fantastic work on, um, from um, Andras group and so on, on on using flash memory, but other ways of retaining state like flash or EEPROM is gonna kill you immediately just because the power consumption of those persistent memory is orders of magnitude higher. So, but deep sleep saves you from having to save state in persistent memory. Uh, and then again, the, the problems that we're looking at is more transient, we're transmitting packets, right? So we cannot go, you cannot wait for a long time. You're actually going and then you're essentially sort of going in sh very short bursts and then sort of uh, stitching them together despite variability. So as you mentioned, there's a lot of, um, you know, the devil is in the details. Right, there's a lot of details behind getting an entire network stack to work means addressing um, uh, multi-node coordination, dealing with collisions, and all of that stuff, and doing all of that, but still retaining the ability to scale down is not, it's taken us a long time, but I, I, I showed you the end result, but the idea is just break it down and just you know, keep the engineering Uh, I think you'd have to have a paradigm where uh, you have to think about gap. The, uh, uh, I think we fr the, the operating system can fragment things, but it cannot figure out, um, uh, you, you know, there are going to be variable size gaps as a consequence of the nature of the energy dynamics. And so the, the difficulty is in how to take an application um, that has some high level requirements and be able to adjust the gaps. I think it can be done, but it's difficult. So for example, in, if it's a moving target, and we have some images, if it's a moving target, you'll get motion blur. Um, and so uh, there are two ways to go about it. Either to say, well, I don't mind the motion blur, I'll deal with it post facto, or to say, constrain the device so that it's not giving me motion blur based data. I like the former. But I, hopefully not, um, hopefully not. Um, Programming at the, at the granularity of pixels? It's hard to say. I, I, I think, I think, I do think there's a, I, I, well, let me, let me take that back. I mean, you know, um, there's a cost. And the cost is programmer complexity. I, you know, I don't think it's going to be easy. I, I think this whole, the world of, oh, let's give this nice clean abstraction, abstract away the hard details. Uh, we tried that for lots of devices. It's never that straightforward. Right, the moat, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, the moat is a 
Power Platform like the Arduino, you know, or even the Arduino for that matter. It's great, but it still requires a learning curve. This will require a learning curve too. I, I don't think it's going to be that um, uh, tricky, but you know, that easy. But that said, I think I think you can isolate the user from de doing things at the network stack level, at the sensor driver level. This is a sensor driver that breaks things down. This is a network stack that breaks things down. This is a task execution engine that breaks things down. Now, can you reconstruct to get your high level goal? I think that is a thought process there, but at least you don't have to program that. So, any other questions? So, um, again, we are also trying to get ECG, and that's our latest, uh, you know, um, project. Uh, can we get pa uh, can we get ECG with backscatter? So, a ch you know, it's a vision, if you will, of a patch. You stick it, forget about it, move on. Can you get that with backscatter working? Even if it's battery powered, the very fact that backscatter as a communication technology consumes 15 microwatts still means that you can run an awfully long, long time if you can get this working. Now, I should mention that the caveat, there is a caveat here, which is, and the caveat is that there needs to be a reader somewhere. And so we're thinking about that as well. You know, how do you get a Wi-Fi access point to be a reader? Or how do you get that integrated with the reader? Hard problems. I won't say we're anywhere close to getting there, but you know, I, you know, I think baby steps. So to conclude, um, you know, there's a remarkable opportunity to sense, but we need to deal with two things: make sense of that data, which is a hard problem, particularly in the real world and deal with this burden and power issues, which is really important if you really, if you want any of this to take off and have people just do it all the time. Um, at this point, I think it's still a, these are platforms and these are ways to, in, in, to um, enhance our understanding from a research perspective. But from the end user perspective, there's still sort of ways to go before people just go off and then do these things, kinds of things. So uh, with that, thank you. You're talking about um, if you're talking about our exposure to, to electromagnetic radiation, there are lots of problems not with backscatter, but just with every other form of radiation you might imagine. So, I mean, a back uh, an RFID reader outputs roughly the same amount of power as a Wi-Fi access point. It's directional, so it's a little bit more perhaps, but it's not that much different from a Wi-Fi access point. The uh, but having a smaller battery is certainly less risk if the battery catches fire. So, so. <laughs> you could, there's, there's that, there's that. I mean, the, you know, you've always, the once in uh, Blue Moon, Motorola, or some other phone battery catching fire makes news, um, even though I, nobody has proved that they didn't set that thing on fire. But. I mean, one advantage of a batteryless device is that it might make it uh, devices embedded in clothing Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, this textile stuff. I, I have no idea. Um, you know, but but I, I do think it's more. I, I think it's easy to just put it in and leave it, right? And and you know, I, I should mention that with textiles and clothing, there's an even harder problem, which is contact with the skin. So you know, how on earth are you going to get? You know, I like people like loose fitting normal textiles. It doesn't give you much contact, so you've got to deal with signal issues and so on. But from I do think it's battery-less means you can just have these kinds of epidome, these electronics that are like tattoos and stuff that's just there and forgotten about. And you know, yeah. Speaking of washable, I mean, presumably if you're wearing it, you're getting it. It's it has to get washed, right? Absolutely. Hopefully. I don't know about some people, but you like to bathe from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> it has to get washed. So you, you're talking about sensors that are worn on the body, but there's another approach, which is to uh, remotely monitor different physiological functions. So you might be able to monitor heart rate, for example, 
breathing, uh, other, other aspects, just by the appearance of the skin and the other movement and so forth. So would you comment on this other world of, of putting the sensors off the body and pointing them? When possible, we want to put sensors anywhere except on the body, right? So um, there's two things there. One is if it's, you know, instrumenting uh, built spaces is a hard problem. It's not as easy a problem either. And you know, from coming from the sensor world, we you know, we've thought about we've done, I mean, instrumenting built systems for everything from, you know, let's figure out the power being consumed by every appliance in your household to um, let's let's uh, you know, it could be monitoring lots of things. But the idea of instrumenting your homes, instrumenting every building, that's been there. I, I think it's a great idea when possible. But it's very hard to instrument the entire living space. Now some people do it, most people don't. Right? And, and that is one, one bottleneck. I think the cost of instrumented buildings is not cheap. That's uh, the second is, but still, you know, burden-wise, uh, when possible, put it where they can see the individual. But the, I also think that the farther away you go from the source, the more noise there is, the more uh, confounders there are, the, the harder it is to sense. The uncertainty increases with distance in many cases, not with all modality. So that's another reason to get close to the source. Of course, the source would be the actual heart, or maybe ingest something or whatever. But 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 you see, you see, I mean, closer to the source, the better. And the closer to the source, the less gaps you might have as you move around and you have all these things. So I think it, there's a continuum. I, I don't think there's an answer except it depends on the circumstance. So for example, if I'm sitting in front of my computer. And I want gaze tracking as I'm looking at apps on the screen, put a gaze tracker on your computer. Right? Perfectly, that's the best solution. But if I want gaze tracking as I am moving around somewhere else, then you have to put it closer to the individual. So I think it depends on the circumstance. Okay. Definitely. So it seems that many of us have the problem that we have too much power. We're taking in too much more calories than we're burning. It can't be possible to. Your self-winding uh, watch requires much less than a microwatt to run. And that is one of the reasons why that is a great application for uh, harvested power, but it is not a it, it does it doesn't reflect the types of sensors. So so I, I think I, let me let me tackle the two things separate. Yeah. Let me tackle those two things. One is uh, uh, harvesting from the individual. You know, if you look out there, there are plenty of really, really cool ideas. Can I harvest power from the blood flow, right? And you know, have devices that move in your bloodstream. Great ideas. I would love to even work on them if I had approval and I could actually do some of these things. But I don't, and I, you know, for that reason, I, I've stayed away from that regime. I think it's great ideas, but I do think there is a fundamental problem, which is power versus um, uh, versus uh, the, the demand versus supply. None of these, because they're small, right? The moment you touch your body and the moment, I mean, I, if I wore, wore a full body armor and I have a bunch of places where I could harvest power, then maybe it's a different matter. But because you've got to keep, keep these harvesters small and localized, you're getting too little power. Um, you know, to run some of these continuously. So I think the, I think that, that that's the right trajectory, but there's still a power demand versus supply problem. Um, but I do think it'll get there. Now, then again, you know, I look at it from a computer scientist perspective, which is I don't want a. I'm not looking at it as one tiny one solution that fits that one problem. We're looking at it as can we have computing devices, general purpose computing devices that we can program and do cool things with, that can operate in these kinds of uh, power regimes. So. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, removing noises from the ECG data. So how about other sensor data? Like if, if I'm analyzing the sensor data, and uh, uh, how could you like find that this data point is valid? You mean removing noise, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think to some extent it is very dependent on the type of signal. In this particular case, we were looking for peaks. And we had peaks of a certain shape. And so we could say, this is, these are the canonical shapes of these peaks, and then sort of apply that idea. 
Uh, we are using something similar for another project where we're looking at smoking behavior and smoking gestures, smoking, drinking, eating kind of gestures. You can look for specific gesture waveforms and then get canonical sort of waveforms of that and try to use that to figure out um, you know, what would be a reliable point versus not. But I do think, I do think it's very sensor specific. You take a, a generic problem, I don't know that there's a generic answer. So it'll have to depend on the, uh, on the specifics of the problem. Thank you.